Good evening. I'm Dr. Vincent Baycoat. I am the director of the Wheaton College Center for Applied Christian Ethics. This year is the 25th anniversary of the Center for Applied Christian Ethics, and that serves as a great opportunity to sort of take stock of where we are and to look forward. That's the reason for having this particular event tonight about the greatest moral challenges in the next decade. This event is sponsored by the David A. Penner Foundation. Some of you uh, coming in may have received uh, this brochure, which will give you lots of detailed information about the Pinner Foundation. In the past, we've had debates. Uh, last year, we sort of had a conversation about evangelicalism and Catholicism, and tonight we're having a roundtable. We have uh, 12 members of the Penner family with us here tonight, so please uh, express your appreciation for their support tonight. You also should have received a three by five card. This is for questions. Uh, we are gonna collect these at the intermission. So uh, when a question comes up from one of the speakers, or if they don't raise a question that you'd like them to address, uh, please write on here and then we're going to uh, sort through these and then uh, Dr. Emmerich will uh, uh, have some of them with uh, the speakers. Now uh, I'm going to turn it over to our new president, Dr. Phil Reichen. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, we're glad that you're here. We're very grateful to the Penner Foundation for sponsoring this event. Uh, thrilled to have this distinguished panel uh, with us tonight. And as we begin, will you please join me for prayer? Our Father in heaven, we give you praise that for Jesus Christ, ethics was never merely theoretical, but always applied. We give you praise for his perfect life, for his demonstration through precept and example of the right and best and perfect way to live. And Father, we give you praise that according to the principles of your word, you give us guidance for every ethical question, whether private and personal, or public and institutional. And yet we recognize our own limitations, Lord, to understand your word and how it should be applied in the world. And so we invoke tonight the presence of your Holy Spirit as we think about great ethical questions in our day. We ask for your help. We ask for your wisdom for the work of the Spirit in the transformation of minds and hearts. And we pray for your blessing on this conversation tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I am very pleased to introduce to you our moderator. He is Dr. Charles Emmerich, Chair of Political Science at Trinity Christian College. He teaches politics and law there, also is the founder and executive director of the Center for Law and Culture, which prepares students for public service in law, government, and politics by providing worldview training from a Judeo-Christian perspective. I am delighted to say he is an alumnus of Wheaton College, uh, earning a BA here in theology and archeology. span He has also completed a law degree at the University of Idaho and an advanced law degree in constitutional law and history at the University of Pennsylvania. He studied there under federal appeals court judge Arlen Adams. He has also served as national director of law and student ministries for the Christian Legal Society. And uh, has, among his many publications, I note particularly uh, his co-authoring uh, with Judge Adams, the book, A Nation Dedicated to Religious Liberty, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, that book has been very well received, praised by prominent legal scholars, uh, cited extensively in several cases of the United States Supreme Court. And will you please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Emmerich. Thank you so much, Dr. Riken, for that kind introduction. It's wonderful to be here tonight. Uh, for the Lord grants wisdom, declares the book of Proverbs. Knowledge and discernment are by his decree. May that be our prayer tonight. May the Lord use this distinguished panel 
to impart wisdom to us. And they are indeed distinguished. Our first speaker, Dr. Larry P. Arn, is the 12th president of Hillsdale College in Michigan and professor of history and political science there. He earned his BA from Arkansas State University and his MA and PhD in government from the Claremont Graduate School. He has also done postgraduate study at the London School of Economics and at Oxford University. The US Army awarded Dr. Arn its Outstanding Civilian Service Medal for exemplary service to the nation. Between 1985 and 2000, he served as the president of the Claremont Institute, published widely in national newspapers, magazines, and periodicals on issues of public policy, history, and political theory. Dr. Arne is the author, most recently, of Liberty and Learning, the Evolution of American Education. Tonight, after I introduce the other two speakers, Dr. Arn will be addressing the dangers posed by modernity's assault on traditional morality. Tonight's second speaker is Dr. Eric McClune. He earned his bachelor's in communications from Wisconsin State University and his MA and PhD in English literature from the University of Dallas. He has over 40 years of teaching experience in subjects ranging from high-speed reading techniques to English literature, media, and communication theory. He assisted Marshall McLuhan with a number of renowned books, including The Medium is the Massage, yes, that is massage, not message, and Laws of Media, the New Science. He has published numerous articles and co-authored the college media text City as Classroom. Perhaps some of you Wheaton students will be using that text. Currently is publishing a book on media and formal cause, another on theories of communication, and a new approach to understanding media called the human equation. I thought he was supposed to be in retirement, but that sounds like a very heavy load. A little known fact about Dr. McClune is that he coined the term media ecology an interdisciplinary field implemented by prestigious Professor Neil Postman at New York University. Dr. McLuhan will discuss how the new media translates us into its image, one we can barely recognize at times. Tonight's final speaker is John F. Kilner. He is professor of bioethics and contemporary culture Foreman Chair of Ethics and Director of Bioethics Programs at Trinity International University in Deerfield, Illinois. He earned a BA from Yale University, an MDiv from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and an MA and PhD in Ethics from Harvard University, frequently appearing on major news networks and contributing to national newspapers Dr. Kilner addresses a wide range or spectrum of bioethical issues, including stem cell research, cloning, genetic intervention, reproductive technologies, physician-assisted suicide, human enhancement, and the cultural values that shape or define all of these issues. He has 17 books to his credit, including most recently biotechnology and the human good. Dr. Kilner will talk about the bioethical challenges posed by human enhancement. Let's please give a hearty round of applause for this distinguished panel. Thank you so much, Professor Emmerich. Um, I noticed you hooted for the new guy, the president, when he walked up here. I give him my greetings and congratulations. Uh, in my own case, I was the new guy for about five years, and then they started getting used to me. <laughs> it's a privilege to be here at Wheaton. I admire Wheaton very much. Uh, Roger Lundeen, and uh, I know him, and I admire him very much in your English department, and Alan Jacobs has written a fantastic book about C.S. Lewis, and 
Uh, Brian Westbury is the most optimistic, serious economist in the country and a friend of mine. So you've produced those three good things, and it must be a great place if they like it here. Sometimes I say Wheaton is uh, in a hot competition to be the second best college on earth. <laughs> but that's only partisanship. Uh, I know two of the daughters of the Penner Foundation, and uh, I can see from meeting more members of the family why they're so charming and smart. And uh, I thank you, too. Uh, we're talking about moral challenges, and since this is a college, we should begin by defining our terms. We will see that if morality is being challenged, we have a serious problem. Uh, we get this term morality from the Latin, where originally it meant pertaining to manners, just how people act. But Cicero, the great man, gave it a much more serious and richer meaning when he used it to translate a Greek term, the term ethikos or ethike. And that word is freighted with huge meaning about the human being, and he elevated and dignified that word. And morality means something like that word ethikos, which in English we so often now translate as character. And it sounds like a little twist, and it is a little bit, but it's interesting to note that the word character comes from the Greek word to etch or to engrave. Your character is not something on the surface of you. Your character is something deep. The founder of our country, more than any other man, was known for his character. And the reason he was known was that people had watched him in, in, on battlefields, twice at least, and the bravest people around had, had uh, looked in awe at the calmness and the command of George Washington and the incredible sacrifice that he would make throughout the war. And then they would look with awe upon him when he had qualified himself by every standard that prevailed in the world to be the king of our country. And instead, he not only refused that title, which he did vehemently, but he went home so that he would be away from people who could work for him to have such a title. His character was golden, and he was reliable. It's a very serious and grave word. The word is defined most authoritatively in Aristotle, which I have the privilege to teach sometimes at Hillsdale College. It is a joy to do that if you have not read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, which has that word in the title, Ethikos. You should do it, and you should know what he means by that word. In Aristotle, you are what you do. You put this etching into yourself, deep into yourself by your own actions. And your actions, because you are human and given by God to be a cause in nature yourself, to choose yourself what you do, these choices are very important things. And they have to have two qualities that together define you and make your whole makeup. And the first quality is choices have to be deliber deliberate. You students, you, you, you uh, should work on this. You should uh, understand that the things that you do, whenever they're important, and by the way, also, if you can manage it, the small things, they should be done for the right reason. If you walk out of here and, uh, and uh, you mean to trip somebody, and instead, by accident, you stop them from tripping, stopping them from tripping is a good act. And yet, if your intention is wrong, it's not a good act. So you are what you do in the sense that you are what you intend. But good intentions are not enough. Your desires are important. You are what you want to do. If you go outside and you might knock somebody down or you might want to take something from somebody and you decide not to do it, because that would be wrong. Here at Wheaton, I can tell by the way the president prays and also by your, your reputation, you think that you have to form your intentions well. If you make good choices as you build your character, your desires begin to come into line with it. So you won't want so much anymore to take from somebody when you shouldn't. Your, your uh, George Washington, uh, when these two things come together, Aristotle describes how the appetites and the, and the uh, will or the deliberate choice come together to make a whole. Thomas Aquinas explains how that is the ideal that is reached only in the Christian saints. And you can see a picture of it. By the way, 
You can see a picture of it right here on Wheaton College campus if you want to look, and I know because I have seen it myself when the man in question was in Hillsdale once. Uh, a vivid example is George Washington on a battlefield. Because when you saw him there, everybody was amazed at the man. And what you could see was the whole of the man was involved. He was the actions he was taking at risk to his life. And the example that you can see here at Wheaton, I've seen Roger Lundeen give an a, a lecture. And I'll tell you what it's like when he's on his form. Uh, there are several friends of his over at my college and they were teasing him that he's not usually that good. I've got a feeling they were teasing and they were telling fibs at the same time. Because what he was explaining was he was explaining the nature of the liberal arts and the joy of reading them in good literature. And I was quite transported by him talking because first of all, the love of the man was fully enrolled in what he was saying. And second, the understanding of the man was fully enrolled. And he was at that moment a whole man. He was what the man is when the man is as it is meant to be. And of course, it has taken the man his entire life to reach that place. And watch him sometime. Remembering what I just said, watch him. And when you read something that he wrote and tell him that you liked it, the charitable look on his face, first of all, that he doesn't really want to accept the compliment. But on the other hand, he recognizes you as a person who has done some of that same preparation. There we have beautiful morality on display. And the challenge that we face is that the phenomenon itself is under attack because the phenomenon of the human being itself is under attack. How can that be? The reason is something changed. There was what was thought to be a realization. It happened mostly in the 19th century. And the nature of this realization is we came to understand that everything that I just said, the specific thing that in America that we came to understand was that when the founders spoke on pain of death, of their obedience to what they called the laws of nature and of nature's God, they were only speaking of a construct. It was something they had come to think because they lived in a certain time. Circumstances had driven them to think it. I'll quote John Dewey, one of the leaders of the school of thought who came to think, you see. By the way, what I said about Lundin, what they would say is that was what was valued in the time in which Lundin grew up. Or it's his personal value, not the man being the man as the man should be or the woman should be. A social construct, a construct, a creation of human beings together over time. Dewey writes, if we employ the conception of historic relativity, nothing is clearer than the conception of liberty is always relative to forces that at a given time and place are increasingly felt to be oppressive. In other words, what we think of our freedom is not to hurl defiance at King George in the name of the laws of nature and of nature's God, pledging while we do it mutually to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Now we know they only thought that because that's when they lived. And this is so powerful that it affects the academic task. Frank Goodnow was one of the creators of the American Political Science Association and for a long time president of Columbia University. We teachers, by the way, I ask you, have you ever at Wheaton College heard anybody say anything like this about the educational task? And the point is, the fact that the answer is probably no marks this place out to be a weird place, different than nearly any college in the land. I come from another. We teachers, perhaps, take ourselves too seriously at times. That I am, he's a lifelong educator. That I am willing to admit. We may not have nearly the influence we think. Changes in economic conditions for which we are in no way responsible 
bring in their train, regardless of what we teach, changes in beliefs and opinions. So in other words, it's not the way the president prays. It's not the way Roger lectures. It's not the attention that you pay or the effort that you make to conform your souls to what God made them to be. It's all these extraneous forces upon you, and they are the creators of your thoughts. But there's a hope in the middle of that. And the hope is we who think these things about everything that was regarded as great in the past, we look back now and know that we have realized something new. And we've realized it by the power of science. And if we could take that power of science and apply it to the world in which we live now, we could make the world into whatever we want. And because we had created it, at last we could understand it. If you want to see that argument profoundly put, read The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis. And then if you want to see it beautifully put in literature, read the companion book, a work of fiction by the same author, That Hideous Strength. Jacobs here in this town can teach you all about that. But if you want to see it at play today, in action, as it is dominating life around us right now, this effort to recreate man and everything he is instead of behold man as a thing in the image of God, I will tell you about a professor from my college who gave testimony in Iowa in the court case about the definition of marriage that came out exactly the same way as the one in California came out and for exactly the same reason. This man has spent his life learning the meaning and the nature of the family. He knows, as it is described in theology, in philosophy, and in history, he also knows the social science of it. And the judge ruled in Iowa, just as the judge ruled in California, that all of the teaching from God and all of the books of philosophy and all of the lessons of history that bear upon the meaning of this institution, which, by the way, is represented so heavily here because the room is full of people between the ages of 18 and 21, and if they were some other kind of being, their parents would not know who they are. All of that kind of teaching was ruled out of court, and it was claimed under the authority of the Constitution of the United States that the only source of a ruling about the family is a social science study. And so do you see what becomes possible? The abolition of man. That is the problem. Thank you. Some years ago, W.B. Yeats wrote a poem called Sailing to Byzantium. And one of the verses goes this way. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. We Christians have always held the doctrine of individual souls and private salvation, which presupposes a ground of private identity and individual responsibility. But the Western world has latterly taken a turn in a very different direction, due entirely to the effects of new media. Private individual identity can no longer be taken for granted. In the high participation world of the internet and interactive technologies, in this situation, even the idea of private salvation loses much of its meaning and its interest. Electric media profoundly challenge the very foundations of individual identity. Each time they transform us into mass audiences, 
The base of private identity is rapidly becoming irrelevant to contemporary experience throughout the West. The new electric mass audience has eight major characteristics, and I want to present those now. One, the mass audience is invisible, composed as it is of de facto intelligences with no bodies. The average person daily uses interactive media from telephone to internet by being transformed into bits of electric information. This disembodiment parodies the condition of angels, and it contributes to the disorientation that people feel in the material world. Number two, minus the physical body, the user of electric media can be in two or two dozen or two million places simultaneously. Everywhere the internet reaches, in fact, the electric crowd lives as if already dead. Consequently, it finds nihilism natural. Death as a way of life has a familiar ring to those who follow the news. The enabling environment um, for the electric crowd is the totality of electric media present and operating via broadcast or network or satellite and so on. So there is the radio crowd and the TV crowd and, and, and so on. All of these are, as it were, dialects of the mass audience. Number three, <clears throat> the electric crowd, composed as it is of new nomads who haunt the metaphysical world, cannot have distant goals or directions or objectives. Those matters pertain to becoming, and the nomad is involved rather with being. Being is not an objective or a goal. With no outer physical body, the mass audience shifts its focus inward. For example, for over 40 years, youth have consistently rejected long-range goals and objectives as irrelevant. This move inward also appears disguised as narcissism, but it is the narcissism or the selfishness of one without a self, rather different from the selfishness that attends private individualism. Fixed goals and becoming belong to incarnate existence. The electrified nomad is wrapped in the ecstasies of sheer being, bereft of all tra traditional ties to the nat natural world and to natural law. In other words, we are floundering. We're disoriented. Each new technology represents one or another modulation of our humanity. Number four. People without physical bodies use participational imagery to generate the emotion and the aesthetics of being, the only reality left after leaving the physical body and the physical world behind. Advertisers a generation ago shifted their attention from products to image, from hard selling of things to participative forms such as lifestyle ads. These provide life fantasies and group identities for all. The mass audience is not characterized by rationality, although individual members of it may be rational. Online or on the air, minus your physical bodies, you put on the corporate body. You wear all mankind as your skin. Under these conditions, a private sensibility would be a, a terrible uh, liability. Number five. The quality of image adjusts the degree of participation. A good, quote, image allows a lot of participation in depth by a big, diverse mass. For this, it must be virtually devoid of content. The aesthetic of these circumstances derives from manipulations of being. Each new electric medium brings with it a new mode of group being, a new we. Hybrid energy bring the biggest kicks of all, and it is in the nature of electric media to hybridize endlessly. Each new medium collects older ones as what we call features, even as it becomes included in the others as a feature, a process that will continue until all have become features of each other. Their future is features. Gadgetry, 
narcissism for the selfless. Number six, the crowd of electrified nomads has no natural boundaries. It o'erleaps all natural and physical limitations. It is exempt from natural law. Number seven, the mass audience <clears throat> was coined, the term was coined to denote broadcast crowds. Sheer speed makes the mass, not numbers. At electric speed, there is no moving to or fro. The user just manifests here or there, having left the body behind. There might be the other side of the room or the other side of town or the other side of the world. It makes no difference. It's all the same. You function in more than one place at once. On the air, you can be, you can have your being in thousands or millions of places simultaneously. Physical laws no longer apply once you leave the physical body. There is nothing on which to base them. You become information. You become an environmental image. Anyone who goes online becomes thereby a de facto node of the worldwide network. This is not an unfamiliar form. Our worldwide net then has its center everywhere and its margin nowhere. Another parody here. Recall the medieval notion of God as having being everywhere and as being nowhere circumscribed. The worldwide network presents a state of complete equality an equality of nobodies. There is no owner, nobody owns the net, nobody is in charge, there's no head office, and every user can say with all fidelity, I am every man, or I am legion. The simple omnipresence of everyone on the worldwide net has some curious consequences. Of a sudden, <clears throat> Every culture on earth finds itself present in every country or nation. Every culture becomes multinational. And for the same reasons, the reciprocal also applies. Every nation instantly becomes multicultural, despite any and every effort to the contrary. Not everybody responds favorably to being invaded by foreign cultures and mores. The Islamic terrorists clearly regarded as a form of toxic pollution of their culture and of their spirits. Obviously, terrorism is a media ecological concern. As is well known, violence is always a factor in establishing or sustaining or retrieving an identity. Number eight, <clears throat> the last characteristic concerns the impact on identities. Now, we believe that each of us is endowed with an individual soul since conception and the concomitant, an individual conscience. The private individual with a private self is also charged with private responsibility for his or her own actions and quests for private salvation. The alphabet literally paved the way for these matters. These are New Testament times. The Old Testament, for example, had declared the Jews a chosen people, group salvation. St. Thomas gives us the formula for individuation. He frequently observes that the principle of individuation is matter necessarily or necess necessitating uh, a material body. To separate the mind or soul from the body is to mime death. It is generally accepted that any, situation, any separation of the two of mind and body results in death. Electric media disturb the natural union of mind and body at the deepest level. They take the user out of nature in a pantomime of death. The new sensibility brings a new fascination with death and the hereafter, increasingly seen as here and now, not hereafter and encourages the growth of nihilism and amorality. Doesn't this illuminate somewhat our culture's present infatuation with euthanasia and abortion? A generation ago, we awoke to a new awareness of the body. It had suddenly transformed into a programmable machine with replaceable parts, a kind of art form to be shaped and molded 
and enjoyed aesthetically at will. The new reality which we all accept without question is this, on the air, on the telephone, on the internet, you are, you have being, in many places simultaneously. These are literally out-of-body experiences, and they're casual, utterly unremarkable features of everybody's everyday life. And they pull the rug out from under individualism. Cyberspace is the home of the group, not the individual. Its natural mode is the hive. Look at the ease <clears throat> with which the kids put on and shed personas in video games as easily as on YouTube and Second Life, MySpace and Facebook, RPGs and LARPs. They can revel in role playing because their senses of identity are very fluid and supple. Role playing is first nature to them, not second nature, it's first nature. Individualism, <clears throat> which results from the intellectual separation of knower from known, is a specific function of the phonetic alphabet. The alphabet and words and language and utterance works through the left hemisphere of the brain. Individualism, too, is a function of the left hemisphere and comes from the phonetic alphabet. No other form of writing, syllabary or pictogram, has the fragmenting power of the phonetic alphabet. Its message of objectivity and detachment laid the ground for private individual awareness several centuries before Christianity had need of it. Now that ground has been supplanted by one that does nothing to encourage or sustain individualism. We know that you cannot simply add a new medium to an existing situation. In the nature of formal cause, each new medium simply engulfs the existing situation and reshapes it from top to bottom. Media are not additive, but transformative. Today, as each new medium penetrates the worldwide net, it transforms the world. Any new medium is a new culture looking for a host. Thank you. A warm thank you to Wheaton, to Case, to the Penner Foundation. What a, what a wonderful testimony the, the very existence of this event is to the notion that the Christian faith has something to say to the big questions that are facing us together. I look forward to the evening to wrestle through some of them together with you. A college student I heard about recently, now this was not somebody at Wheaton, mind you, went to a church near the campus one Sunday morning, and he went into the church, sat down in the pew, uh, looked through the worship bulletin, turned to the woman sitting next to him and said, I can't believe this. You know, I, I go to the college nearby here, and I just had to listen this week to two of the most boring lectures I've ever heard in my life from this professor. Now I come to church on Sunday, and he's the guest preacher. She looks at him and says, do you know who I am? No, he says. She says, I'm that boring professor's wife. <laughs> After stunned silence for a couple minutes, uh, he turned to her and said, do you know who I am? No, she said. Good, he replied, and he ran out of the sanctuary. <laughs> well, we have to be careful what we communicate, don't we? And I'm particularly mindful this evening that in addressing the topic of bioethics in the next decade uh, and the mindset of human enhancement that is increasingly driving it, I may miscommunicate if I leave the impression that there's something suspect about human flourishing. I mean, Christians should be leading the charge for humanity to be the best that it can be. But what is this best that humanity aspires to? Ah, there's the rub. So what is the future looking like these days? Now, the words of Groucho Marx have never been truer. The future ain't what it used to be. The future used to be about people looking at things under a microscope and assessing what improvements need to be made or deciding, in fact, if something entirely different was needed instead. Now, people themselves are under the microscope. And the future agenda is not about healing problems, but enhancing the capacities of people in unprecedented ways. 
even considering if something entirely different is needed in place of human beings as we now know them. Yes, indeed, the future is not what it used to be. So what will it all look like? Well, it'll begin with replacing more parts of humans with electronic and computerized technologies, not just arms and legs, but the very hearts of people. And not far behind that will be developments as dramatic as replacing human wombs with technological ones. Now, consider the impact of that on even the most basic and familiar of bioethical challenges, abortion. I mean, the abortion debate is all about the mother's right to control her body, even if the fetus's life does matter. Now, take the mother out of the equation, because a child before birth can always be transferred to an artificial womb, and even the most familiar of bioethical debates is completely changed. But replacing the heart and the womb as central to human existence as they are is rather superficial compared to where things are going. The human brain, some would say the very person, is now the target. If a fleshy brain is good, well, wouldn't a computer be even better? It could always be repaired and upgraded, never die like a brain does. Now, the first step is to be able to transfer information between brains and computers. <laughs> and many would say today, well, that's just the stuff of pure science fiction. I mean, it makes for a good story, they say, but you, you can't just plug a computer into the flesh of a brain. Well, think again. It's been done for many years now. I mean, at the Brown University Institute for Brain Science, for example, they've enabled paralyzed people to operate a computer, to type, to run a robotic arm, simply by thinking. So with the brain-computer gulf already crossed, well, then what's next? If transmitting information from brains to computers works, well, why not transferring information from computers to brains? Now, I'm sorry to break it to those of you who are students today, which is most of us gathered here. You're about a generation too early. Now, you have to study the old-fashioned way laboriously pouring in all of that information through your eyes and through your ears. One of the goals that is involved here is something completely different. Now, I'm not sure if it's going to look exactly like this, but the idea is insertable or better, implantable brain chips that will enable the downloading of vast amounts of information directly into the brain. Plus, it'll give our brains direct mental access to a vastly expanded internet. Now, here in an educational setting, we can Im immediately see the tremendous benefits of access to that level of knowledge right from our brains. But we also know all too well how frustrating viruses can be when they slow down or shut down our computers. How about giving them access to our brains? Actually, the ultimate agenda here is not merely enhancing our brains by connecting them to better information sources. It's actually to replace them entirely, at least in their biological aspect. Rather than merely downloading information to the brain, the goal is uploading the contents of the brain itself into an electronic, digitalized existence where it can take on robotic, computerized forms when it wishes to and will continue to exist consciously forever. Now, this is what Nick Bostrom, Francis Fukuyama, and others refer to as our post-human future for we will no longer be human in fundamental ways, including our bodily existence. As Catherine Hales puts it in her book, How We Became Post-Human, humans can either go gently into that good night, joining the dinosaurs as a species that once ruled the earth but is now obsolete, or hang on for a while longer by becoming machines themselves. In either case, the age of the human is drawing to a close. Bart Costco agrees in his book, Heaven in a Chip. Quote, biology is not destiny, he says. It was never more than tendency. It was just nature's first quick and dirty way to compute with meat. Chips are destiny. Now, accordingly, the movement of transhumanism, humanity in transition, is gaining steam. We're in a transition to a post-human future, many say, whether we like it or not. In fact, this is what you look like through the cosmic eye of history. Can you identify with this? 
perhaps it's too soon still. But to urge this transition on, such global networks as the World Transhumanist Association and the World Transhumanist Society have arisen. Their primary documents, such as the Transhumanist Declaration and the Transhumanist FAQ, are appropriately only produced in electronic form. Much of what they commend is, in fact, commendable. I mean, they want a better life for people, and that begins, they say, not only with curing people of their illnesses and their injuries, but also with simple human enhancements, such as exercise and education. Now, when enhancement is used in this sense, as any improvement upon what would be the so-called normal or natural course of things, well, then it quickly becomes apparent that dismissals of all human enhancements are misguided. But a movement must be assessed not merely on the basis of what it commends today as its first steps, but also where it is leading us tomorrow and the ways of thinking, the ethics that it espouses to get us there. So let's take a brief look then at the ultimate vision and the ways of thinking that the human enhancement movement commends to us to see if Christians can be fellow travelers. First, the ultimate vision. Now, as we've already noted, the aspiration here is immortality in this world. How well does that vision fit with a Christian vision of what our life is to be focused on? Well, in the Bible, in the third chapter of Genesis, we read about the life of difficulty and strife that people will experience thereafter because people decided to live life their own way rather than trusting in God's direction. With that strife in view, God says that humanity, represented by Adam, must not be allowed to live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden. Now, this banishment is, co is commonly understood to be God further punishing people for rejecting him. But this is a great example of God's mercy and not merely God's justice. For to have left the way open to eternal life in this world would have merely given us an eternity of suffering and tears. God had something much better in mind, an opportunity for forgiveness in which the death of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, would transform death itself into a doorway to immortality. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning. With our powerful technology, we may aspire to retake the Garden of Eden, undoubtedly an uploaded and enhanced version of this, of course, in order to achieve our lost immortality. But that would be to reject a second time the glorious eternal life that God has prepared for those who love him, thereby removing all hope of an unending life of pure joy. So a momentous question lies before us. Who is to be our God? Who truly has the power to conquer death? In fact, whose version of eternal life do we even prefer? Now, as I indicated earlier, the ultimate vision of the human enhancement movement is one important consideration. What we aspire to does have a profound influence upon us. But we also need to consider the ways of thinking that the human enhancement movement commends to us since those more directly govern our next steps forward. And when we do, we'll find that these ways of thinking are not newly emerging, but, but are dealing with uh, moral challenges that have been competing with Christian outlooks for a long time now. What's different now is the scope of all that is at stake because of the huge advances in technology, such as cybernetics, including the brain-computer communication we've been talking about, and nanotechnology, engineering at the minute level of molecules. The very basis of morality itself is at stake. What's the basis of right and wrong? Well, as we've already seen, God and God's intentions for humanity and the world are nowhere in the picture here. We're left with the following credo in the transhumanist FAQ. Individuals are to shape themselves and their lives according to their informed wishes. This is a far cry from the psalmist ad admonition, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. What we do with our lives is not whatever we wish, but what God wishes as best we can discern that in our best and most humble efforts working together. Now, this understanding of moral decision-making only intensifies in the New Testament 
As Paul reminds us, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Apparently, it's not up to us what we do with our bodies, including whether or not we even continue to have physical bodies. But the enhancement movement is about autonomy in the contemporary postmodern sense of that, as literally meaning self-law. The self determines what the moral law is, what's right and wrong for me. Everything is a matter of my perspective. There's no objective truth or reality beyond myself. Now, in addition to being unbiblical, it doesn't really work out all that well, practically speaking, in everyday life as portrayed in this picture here of the evolution of the stop sign as seen through the increasingly autonomy-oriented <laughs> postmodern eye. Now, this mindset has opened the door widely to a number of bioethical challenges that have only begun to gain momentum and will become more prominent in the decade ahead. For example, now that three U.S. states have legalized assisted suicide, pressures are mounting for legalization in many other states. The driving force here is autonomy, in the sense of people claiming the right to do whatever they wish to do with what they call my life. Similarly with human cloning. It turned out to be more difficult, technologically speaking, than originally anticipated. Um, you know, this magazine, for example, was way too optimistic on the timeline. And years ago, many people resigned themselves to the likelihood that the major breakthrough would have to await the next decade coming up before us. But the cultural attraction here is formidable. Cloning means there being more of you in the world. And the clamor is predictably great to be allowed to pursue that sort of extension of yourself if that's what you wish to do. Once God is out of the picture then, the self becomes the primary moral authority in the eyes of many. But as the evolution of the stop sign has just reminded us, everyone's view of what to do is not the same. So how are moral decisions to even be made if people's interests conflict? Well, the appeal then is not to autonomy, but to utility. The classic utilitarian credo is that every, if everyone can't get what they want, well, at least we can do whatever will give the greatest possible number of people what they value most. The greatest good for the greatest number, it's sometimes put. Now, the danger here is that some individuals or minority groups can be subjected to serious harms if doing so sufficiently benefits the majority. What protects against this in a Christian outlook is the recognition in the book of Genesis, for example, that human beings are created by God in the image of God, and therefore innocent human beings can't be killed. By its categories of creation in its first chapter, Genesis appears to consider to be a human being whatever is both a living being and identifiably human as opposed to plant or animal. This significance attaches to people um, and the significance that is attached there in no way lessens the importance of other living things, though some have claimed that Christianity promotes that idea. Many transhumanists are among them. And accordingly, in the same uh, section of the transhumanist FAQ quoted earlier, it insists that transhumanists reject the view that being human necessarily gives anyone moral status and warrants their protection. Now, that should give us pause as genetic and stem cell technologies ramp up in the next decade. You see, cloning is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we'd like to think that we didn't turn out so badly and that more exact copies of us in the world would be a good thing. But in our most honest moments, we'd all admit that there are a few things about ourselves, wouldn't we, uh, that we'd like to change? And so the agenda very quickly becomes developing the genetic technology to design children with all of the genetic traits that parents want. That prospect raises its own challenge in terms of the undermining of unconditional love. But it's technically quite a ways off in the future. Nevertheless, a precursor to that technology has already arrived and is rapidly becoming more common. It's known as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD in which parents produce multiple embryos through a technology like in vitro fertilization and then test them genetically to see if they have the health traits and the personal traits, like gender, for example, that the parents prefer. 
those who don't have the desired traits are then thrown away. Meanwhile, in embryonic stem cell research, embryonic human beings frozen after in vitro fertilization but no longer wanted by their parents are also destroyed. Although the personal good of these youngest of humans would be best served by being adopted as embryos by couples who want to raise them, as the children you see here were, the utilitarian greatest good for the greatest number dictates that they be destroyed for use in embryonic stem cell research. Perhaps, in fact, we could discuss a little later the court case that's just been out this last week on this very issue. So contemporary society is significantly influenced by the ethics of autonomy and utility, in which there are no moral givens because there's no moral giver. In other words, there's no God. And transhumanism, among other outlooks, is connecting emerging human enhancement capabilities with those ways of thinking and with an ultimate vision of immortality in this world. Now, every human enhancement is not wrong, but each must be evaluated in light of the ultimate vision and the ways of thinking that are driving it, among other considerations. We're being offered many possible avenues to pursue today as we travel down the information highway, but we need more than information. We need wisdom. God invites us to look to him and to his word for the wisdom that we need regarding ultimate visions, ways of thinking, and so much more. We can well appreciate, I think, people's desperation to forestall death as life passes all too rapidly by, but we would do well to remember that because of Christ, we do not have a hopeless end. We have an endless hope. Thank you for your gracious attention.